Hello students, today we will discuss about the anatomy of esophagus. In today's this part, we will talk about the course of the esophagus and the relations of the esophagus. So let us talk about the esophagus. So what is esophagus? It is a muscular tube. That means when you will see the esophagus, it is made up of the muscles. And you know that it is having the smooth muscles as well as the skeletal muscles when you are reading the histology of the esophagus. The another important thing is that it is the second narrowest part of your digestive tube. So which is the first part? So the narrowest first part of the digestive tube is your vermiform appendix, clear? So this is the question for your exam, which is the narrowest part, then you have to answer is vermiform appendix. But if you will have the second narrowest part, then the answer is esophagus. What is the extension of esophagus? Now you know that whenever you are having something in your mouth and that food is actually passing from the pharynx into the esophagus and from the esophagus, the food will enter into the stomach. So the esophagus extends from the pharynx and it will end into the stomach and it consists of the three parts. So the whole length of the esophagus, when it starts into the neck and end into the abdomen, it has been divided into the three different areas. The part which is present in the neck is known as cervical region. The part which is below the diaphragm here is known as abdominal part and the part which will remain into the thorax is known as thoracic part. So the esophagus is having the three part, cervical, thoracic and abdominal. Now in this diagram itself, you can see that the thoracic part is the longest part of the esophagus. So the length, the total length starting from the pharynx to the end of your, uh, at the st stomach, the total length of esophagus is 25 centimeters or you can say the 10 inches. So this is very, very frequently asked question in exam. Now you have the duodenum, duodenum is also having the length of 25 centimeters, clear? Now the important thing is that the thoracic part is the longest part which is around 20 centimeter long and the smallest part is the abdominal part which is 1 to 2 centimeters in long, clear? Now what is the course of esophagus? So when you will see the beginning, it begins in the neck as a continuation of the pharynx at the lower border of cricoid cartilage. Now in this image, if you will see, you can see that here you can appreciate that this is your thyroid cartilage and below that you are able to see this is your cricoid cartilage. Now below the cricoid cartilage, you are having the point of the beginning of esophagus. So beginning of esophagus is at the level of lower border of cricoid cartilage. This part is actually going to form your trachea which we will present here. So anteriorly you will have the trachea and the, this part is the larynx which will continue into that trachea. But for the continuation we are seeing, we are taking this as a bony landmark. So what is the anteriorly bony landmark? is the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. So this is the lower border of cricoid cartilage, which is actually the junction of this pharyngeal tube and the esophagus, clear? Now, when you will see the vertebral label, posteriorly you have the vertebrae, you will find that it is the C6 vertebrae. So here also, if you will see, this is your C1, this is your C2, and if you will go down, this is your third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So you will find that this label is actually crossing the six cervical vertebrae. So there are two questions in your exam. First question is at, at what level the esophagus starts, then you may have the two answer. The first answer is in the form of the lower border of cricoid or the second answer is the C6 vertebrae. Clear? So cervical vertebrae are present posteriorly and at the level of 6th cervical vertebrae, you will have the junction of the lower end of pharynx and upper part of esophagus. Then it runs in, for, in front of the vertebral column and it ultimately enters into the thoracic cavity and in the thoracic cavity, it present in superior and posterior mediastinum. So here you can see now it is going downward 
and you can see this is the first trip so the esophagus now enters into the superior mediastinum and then it will pass through the posterior mediastinum so what is the course of the esophagus through the superior mediastinum so in the superior mediastinum it lies behind the arch of aorta and trachea so this is the first relation of your uh, esophagus so when you will read the relation separately and when you are reading the course you have to actually understand both the things simultaneously so when you will see the relation in the thorax now here you can see that this is your arch of aorta now this arch of aorta is actually going posteriorly and then it will continue as a thoracic aorta now my dear students you have to first understand that superior mediastinum is separated from inferior mediastinum by a line and that line passes from the t4 t5 junction so if you'll go posteriorly you will find that this is your first rib this is your second rib third rib and fourth rib and you will see the junction you will find that this is your junction of t3 t4 so where is the junction of t3 t4 so this is the junction of t4 t5 so this is the junction of t4 and t5 thoracic vertebrae clear so this area is known as superior mediastinum so this area is known as superior mediastinum and in this superior mediastinum you are able to see only the two things one is the trachea which is the your air pipe where you have the uh, air which is passing from the larynx and it will go into the lungs so you have to understand that trachea lies anterior to the esophagus so this is your esophagus and the second thing is that in the lower part of superior mediastinum you can see that this is your arch of aorta clear and you know that arch starts and end at this line of demarcation between the superior and inferior mediastinum and this line is passing from the t4 t5 junction clear so when you are reading the course in superior mediastinum it is passing from the superior mediastinum behind the trachea and behind the arch of aorta now in this image it is an enlarged view where you can very well appreciate this relation that this is your arch of aorta and this is your trachea and this is your esophageal tube which is present here so esophageal tube is actually hidden behind this trachea clear and when you will see in the superior mediastinum which is actually at this level now we are talking about this part which is superior mediastinum you are seeing that this is the arch and this arch will start from the heart and it ends at the same level where it continue as a descending or thoracic aorta clear so these are the two important structures which lies anterior to the esophagus now what is the course in the posterior mediastinum you know that inferior mediastinum divided into the three part by the heart anterior middle and posterior mediastinum so when you will see the posterior mediastinum you will realize that posterior mediastinum is containing the esophagus it will have the thoracic duct it will have the azygous veins it will have the your aorta that is the descending part so these all structures are behind the heart that means in the posterior mediastinum so when we are talking about the course through the posterior mediastinum there are few important vertebral level comes the first is the at the level of t5 it is in front and to the right of the descending aorta then uh, what happen, happens at the level of t7 it deviates to the left and curves forward to pass in front of the descending thoracic aorta so here there are two important thing is that at the level of t5 at t5 in front and to the right of descending aorta so here you have to understand that i just told you that why we are talking about t5 because up to the t5 the arch will finish and the descending aorta will start so now we are actually talking inside the posterior mediastinum which is below the imaginary line of t4 t5 and that's why we are talking about the t5 level we are not talking about t4 level we are not talking about t3 level because the t3 t4 levels are in the superior mediastinum 
and posterior mediastinum is a part of inferior mediastinum which is below the T4 level. So that's why we start from the T5 and at the level of T5 at in front of and right of the descending aorta. So here you can see that this is your level and this is your descending aorta. So esophagus is on the right side of your this descending aorta. But when you will go downward, you will realize that esophagus is turning. Now this esophagus is taking a turn towards the left side. Now this turn of the left side is start at the level of T7. Clear? So at the T5, the aorta comes on the left side or you can say esophagus lies on the right side of the aorta and at the level of T7, the esophagus take a left turn and when it is taking a left turn, it runs anterior to the aorta in lower part. Clear? So there are three things which we you are reading. One is above this level, that means you are talking about the superior mediastinum here and when we are talking about the inferior mediastinum below this level, we are actually starting the understanding from the T5. Now this is the T5 posteriorly and initially this is your descending aorta and this is your esophagus which are side by side structures but slowly the esophagus comes anteriorly and to the left. So it is at the T5 where you have the right side esophagus and the left side aorta and at the T7 it is taking left deviation and crossing the aorta from the front. Now ultimately what will happen that then it pierces the diaphragm 2.5 centimeters to the left of the midline at the level of T10. Now my dear friends you already know that the diaphragm is having three big opening. One is the vena cava opening then you will have esophageal opening and then we have the gap which is known as aortic hiatus. So this esophagus is actually going to open into the abdominal cavity through the T10 level opening and this T10 level opening is esophageal opening. But the important thing to understand that this opening is not in the midline. It is actually left side of the midline. How much left? 2.5 centimeter left to the midline. That's why you can see that this deviation is there and that's why the esophagus is deviating towards the left because it is approaching the opening which is present here in the diaphragm. That opening is not in the center otherwise the this esophagus will go straight. Clear? Finally, it ends and continue as a cardiac orifice of the stomach at the level of T11 and that orifice or upper end of the stomach is also present 2.5 centimeter left to the midline. Clear? That means if I have to draw the stomach here, I will draw the stomach like this. So when you will draw the stomach in this pattern, you will realize that this is the cardiac end of the stomach and this cardiac end of the stomach is not here in the midline. It is 2 centimeter or 2 to 5 centimeter left from the midline. Clear? Now what about the curvatures? Now when you will trace the course of the esophagus, you will realize there are two curvature, anteroposterior and side by side. Now anteroposterior curvatures are nothing but they are just following the course of your vertebral column or the curvatures of the spine. So you will have the cervical curvature and the thoracic curvature. But the side by side curvatures are important to understand. Now you will realize that at most of the time the esophagus runs in the midline but it deviates towards the left at two point. So what are these two places? First at the commencement that means at the level of C6 cervical vertebrae. The second deviation is seen at the level of T7 which I just told, told you that at the T7 it will start taking deviation towards the left. Clear? So there are side by side deviation and there are antero posterior deviation. So what is the side by side deviation? So it is having left deviation at the commencement then it runs downward and at the T7 it take a left deviation. Clear? Now this slide is very important. You have this question very commonly in your exam. 
what are the four constrictions of the esophagus and these constrictions are normally present in the esophagus so what are these four space four levels of constriction so the first level is at the commencement that means at the level of c6 now at the level of c6 you are having the first constriction now this constriction which is present here at the level of c6 that means at the starting point of the esophagus is because of a muscle is known as cricopharyngeus and this cricopharyngeus is actually the part of inferior constrictor muscle of pharynx now when you will read the pharynx you will have the circular muscle layer longitudinal muscle layer the circular muscles of the pharynx are known as constrictors you can see the detail in my video of the pharynx so you will realize that there is a muscle named cricopharynx and this cricopharynx is responsible for the production of the first constriction and out of the four constriction this is the narrowest part of the esophagus that means when you are passing any tube in the esophagus you will feel the maximum resistance at this point and this resistance comes when if you will start the measurement from the teeth this resistance come 6 inches from your incisor teeth so this measurement is also a question for your exam that suppose you are passing a riles tube or you are passing a uh, esophagoscope at what level the first constrictions as feel or at what distance from the incisor the first con con resistance feel so answer is 6 inches from the inside the teeth now below that opposite the level of t4 you are having a second constriction and it is produced by the crossing of arch of aorta and it lies 9 inches from the inside the teeth that means 3 inches below the beginning so if you will see here you can see that this is the arch of aorta and this arch is also creating a constriction on this esophagus which is here clear then the third constriction this comes at the level of t6 here it is crossed by the left principal bronchus you know that trachea will divide into the two part right and left principal bronchus and now here you can see that this is the left principal bronchus which is crossing the esophagus it is creating one of the constriction and that is at the level of t6 and the final constriction or the fourth constriction is present at the level of T10 and this is actually the esophageal opening in the diaphragm itself. And this opening, that this constriction lies around 15 to 16 inches from the incisor teeth. And this is the last resistance field when you are passing the scope through the esophagus. So this is the very important question for your exam that how many anatomical constrictions are there in the esophagus answer is 4. First constriction is produced by the cricopharyngeus muscle. The second constriction is produced by the crossing of arch of aorta. Third constriction is produced by the cross of the left principal bronchus and the fourth constriction is the opening through the diaphragm. Clear? Now. What are the relations of the esophagus? So first we will see the relation in the cervical area that means in the neck. So in the neck you know that I already told you that larynx and trachea lies anterior to the esophagus. So in front you have the trachea. Now what is the posterior? Now suppose if you removed the whole uh, uh, pipes that means your trachea and esophagus from this area on the posterior side you will find the cervical vertebrae and along with the cervical vertebrae you will find these muscles and these muscles are known as longus coli muscle what is the name of this muscle longus coli muscle so in this image you are not able to see the esophagus but you can see the structure behind the esophagus so these are your cervical vertebrae and on the side of cervical vertebrae you can see that these are the longus coli muscle so esophagus lies on this area clear so the posterior relation is the cervical vertebrae and the longus coli but on the contrary you will find that these areas are covered by 
a fascia and that fascial tube is known as the tube of your prevertebral fascia. So that tube is present here and this is your prevertebral fascia which is going to cover your cervical vertebrae as well as the longus coli muscle. So you will find that if you will place the esophagus here, this tube of prevertebral fascia and the prevertebral muscle and the vertebral column become posterior relation of the esophagus. Then what is the structure on the sides? Now when you will see the side of the esophagus, you will find a very important relation that is the thyroid gland and along with the thyroid gland, there is a presence of a artery is known as common carotid artery. So you know that thyroid gland is present here. So the posterior part of the lobes of the thyroid is actually in the relation of the esophagus. So here in this video clip, you can see all these relations. Now here, if you first see from the front, you are able to appreciate this is your thyroid gland. Now this thyroid gland is a H shaped gland. And this H-shaped gland is having the two lobes. And these lobes posteriorly are in the relation of esophagus. So this esophagus is here. Esophagus starts here from this point that is the lower end of the cricoid. And it will go downward. In this area, the esophagus is not visible because anteriorly you are having the trachea. But again, the esophagus is visible lower. Why? Because the trachea will bifurcate and the trachea will end at this level. So, you have to understand that when you will see the all the relations and if you will see the side, you can find that posterior to the esophageal tube, you have this spines and the prevertebral muscle. And on the side, you can see that this is the common carotid artery on one side, this is the common carotid artery on the other side. So, this is the important thing to understand that when you are talking about the posterior relation, you have to realize that behind the esophagus, you are having the prevertebral muscles and the vertebral spine. And that spine is actually along with the muscle covered by the prevertebral fascia. Clear? Now, what are the relations of the thoracic part? Now, thoracic part, I told you it is the longest part, which is having 20 centimeter actually the area. And this thoracic part reasons relations has been divided into the anterior, posterior and right and left relation. So what are the anterior relation? So anterior relations, you have to keep in mind, they are from above downward. We are not talking about the anterior relation at one particular point. We are going from above downward because it is a long area of 20 centimeter. So what is the first structure is the trachea. Now this trachea is remain anteriorly and we know that it is not present in the whole length because it is going to terminate at the T4, T5 junction where it will bifurcate. Now below the trachea, if you will do the dissection, you will find the arch of aorta. Then below the arch of aorta, you are having the right pulmonary artery and the left principal bronchus. So this is again the question of your exam. So that's why you have to understand that the pulmonary artery is of the right side, but the principal bronchus of the left sides are in relation anteriorly from above downward. That means the artery is above and bronchus is below. Now below that, there is a centrally placed heart or you can say that is the main part of the middle mediastinum. So that is the front relation or anterior relation. So, because you know that the esophagus is a area of your posterior mediastinum, so what is the structure lies anterior to posterior mediastinum is middle mediastinum. And what you have in the middle mediastinum, you have the fibrous pericardium and along with the fibrous pericardium, you have the heart. So, which part of the heart comes in contact with the esophagus, you know that posteriorly you will have the base of the heart and base of the heart is formed by left atrium. So the left atrium is actually the chamber of the heart which comes in relation in front of your esophagus. Then ultimately lowerly you have the relation with the diaphragm. So in this image you can see that what are the structures related from above downward. So when you will go from above downward you can see this is the trachea which is bifurcating here. Now, because of this bifurcation, this left bronchus is come in contact. 
Now below that if you will go, if you will see below that, now this is what you have to understand in this enlarged view that this is your right side pulmonary clear and this is your aorta, uh, this is your uh, left side bronchus. So these are the two things which you have to understand that right pulmonary artery and the left principal bronchus clear. So this is your right pulmonary artery and this is your left principal bronchus. So these two things are actually crossing the esophagus and this is your arch of aorta clear. So when you are having this question in exam sometimes you have this MCQ that which side artery so artery is of the right pulmonary artery and which side bronchus the left pulmonary uh, principal bronchus. Now this diagram is showing the relation of your heart with the esophagus. Now here in this image you can see that this is the posterior part of the heart that is known as base of the heart and this base of the heart here is formed by a chamber is your left atrium and you know that here you have the oblique sinus. So actually the heart or I should say more specifically the oblique sinus comes in contact anterior to the esophagus. So this is your esophageal tube and anterior to the esophagus this is your heart and which chamber of heart answer is the right side of left atrium clear. So this left atrium is in direct contact with the anterior part of the over esophagus and you have the oblique sinus in this space. Now the next is the posterior relation of the thoracic part. So what you will find behind the uh, esophagus? So the most common thing which you will find behind the esophagus is the deep structures of posterior mediastinum. So what you will have deep to the do deep structure in the posterior mediastinum the structures those are running on the posterior wall of the chest wall. So on the posterior chest wall you are having a zygous vein you have hemi azygous vein you have accessory hemi azygous vein you have intercostal arteries you have thoracic duct. So you have already read these structures in your posterior mediastinum. And we are placing the esophagus in front of the vertebral column. So all these structures along with the vertebral column automatically become the posterior relation of the esophagus. So there is no need to mug up the list of the posterior relation because you have to just write down the posterior wall of the chest which is actually automatically comes in posterior relation. So here you will have the vertebral column the first relation because we have the vertebral spine in the midline posteriorly. Now there is a one important thing is that the right posterior intercostal arteries and vein. Now why because you will see here that this is our uh, thoracic aorta and you can see that the right side arteries are crossing the midline to enters into the intercostal spaces of your right side. While the left side arteries are shorter and they immediately enters into the left intercostal space. So when you will have the placement of your esophagus, suppose if you will have the tube here, you will realize that behind this tube of tube that is esophagus, you have the right side posterior intercostal artery, clear? Why? Because the right arteries are longer, they are arising from the aorta which is on the left side of midline. This is the one thing. Then second thing is that what you are having in the posterior relation is a zygous vein. Now here in this diagram you can see that this blue color is your azygous vein and this azygous vein is actually also receiving the accessory azygous and hemi azygous vein. So these veins are also very closely related to the posterior part of the posterior mediastinum. So when the esophagus comes here, these all relations become posterior. Apart from that, you are also having the thoracic duct. So the thoracic duct is here. Now you can see that this is the thoracic duct and this thoracic duct is going inside the posterior mediastinum through the aortic opening. But you know that thoracic duct is not present in one side throughout the length. It will change its direction and it ultimately comes on the left side and it make a loop and it ultimately opens into the left junction of brachiocephalic vein and internal jugular vein. So 
you will realize that all these structures will come behind your esophagus and they will become the posterior relation. So what are the posterior relation? If you will just read out this list, vertebral column, right posterior intercostal artery, the azygous system of the vein along with the hemiazygous, accessory hemiazygous and the thoracic duct. But the thoracic duct is having very important relation that at first it lies behind and on the right and at the level of T5 it cross from right to left and then it ascend on the left side. So if you remember my class of your thoracic duct, we have seen the formula of 7 plus 5 is equal to 12. That means it begins at the level of T12 and it remains on the right side and it cross right to left at the level of T5 and it terminates at the level of C7. So you have to understand that thoracic duct is related initially on posterior and right and at the level of T5 uh, it crosses and then it comes on the left side. And the lastly, the posterior relation is the descending thoracic outer. Now why descending thoracic outer? Because uh, we have already seen that as this esophagus approaches downward, it will not go vertically downward straight. It will take a left turn at the level of C7. Why left turn? Because it will have a esophageal opening in the diaphragm, which is 2 centimeter left from the midline. Clear? So that's why it goes anterior to the aorta and this is the aorta and it will take a turn from anterior side. Now here you can appreciate the relation which actually I am talking about. You can see that it is taking a left turn. So because this is taking a left turn in the lower part, it is actually now become anterior to this descending aorta. But it is not anterior in the whole length. It is anteriorly only in this lower part and it is actually the turn start at the level of T7. Clear? Now here in this diagram you can see that these are the posterior relations of your esophagus and here we placed the esophagus in the position so that now you can realize that all the structures are behind the esophagus. Now what are the relations on the left side? Now here in this image if you will see we have removed the right lung you can see the esophagus is going downward which is straight and then taking a left turn and you are able to see the left lung and the mediastinal surface of left lung. So what are the structures on the left side of esophagus? So on the left side of esophagus you can see that in upper part I already told you you have the this green color line which is your thoracic duct. So we have seen that thoracic duct come on the left side at the level of T5 and then it make it turn to end at the level of T C7. Apart from that you can see the this posterior part of the arch and from the arch you can see this is the origin of the left side of subclavian artery. Now you can see that this is the vagus now, the vagus now is entering but from the vagus there is a origin of this recurrent laryngeal now. This is your recurrent laryngeal now which is making a loop and it is going again inside your neck. So this recurrent laryngeal now is coming in very close relation on the left side of the esophagus. Apart from that you have the relation with the posterior placement or the posterior side of your left lung and left pleura. So if you will see the list, you will find the same things is written here. In superior mediastinum, that means above this level, you will have the relation with the arch of aorta, left subclavian artery, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, thoracic duct, lungs and pleura. But when you will see the left relation into the posterior mediastinum, it is only the descending aorta. So up to this level, up to this level, on the left side you have multiple structures, but in the lower part you have only the two things which are on the left side, one is the aorta and second is the lung. But later on this aorta will go posteriorly because your esophagus will cross anteriorly, clear? So what are the relation on the left side? You have the left lung, you have the left uh, subclavian artery, you have the arch, you have the left recurrent laryngeal now and definitely the terminal part of thoracic duct. Now what are the relation on the right side? Now if you will see the relation on the right side, on the right side you have the right lung, on the right side you have the azygous vein, clear? So when you will see the visceral impressions on the right and left lung, you will find that right lung is having the arch 
impression for the zygous vein while the left lung is having the arch impression formed by the arch of aorta. So you can see that this is a midline esophagus. On the left side you have a arch, on the right side you are having a arch. So what is the relation? On the right side the main important thing you are able to see is the arch formed by the your azygous vein. Apart from that you are related with the right lung, right pleura and the right vagus now, not the recurrent. Why? Because the right recurrent is very higher in origin and that is actually arise here at the level of the clavicle, below the clavicle, clear? So these are the three important relations on the right side, the right lung, right pleura, arch of azygous vein and right vagus now. So this will become important to understand that in the superior mediastinum, the esophagus is actually having the two arches on both the side. The right side arch is azygous vein and left side arch is arch of aorta. Now what are the relations of abdominal part? Now abdominal part is hardly 1 to 1.5 centimeter long which lies below the esophageal opening or you can say below the diaphragm. But the important thing is that which I am saying again and again that that is not in the midline. It is one. Uh, it is 2 to 2.5 centimeter from the midline and it is towards the left side. So you have the in front left lobe of the liver. The anterior relation is the left lobe of the liver and anterior vagal trunk. That is the anterior relation. And what is the posterior relation? The posterior relation is the posterior vagal trunk, the left crust of diaphragm and left inferior phrenic artery. Now this posterior relation is actually explained that because your junction is on the left side, you are related with the left side structures posteriorly. And that is the left crust of diaphragm and left phrenic artery. When you will see the esophagus, you have the right and left vagal nerves which are running. And these vagal nerves are going to form the vagal trunk. So when you will see this view from below, now we are seeing from below through the abdominal cavity, this is the inferior surface of diaphragm. And in this you can see the exit of your esophagus. And this exit is not in the midline, it is towards the left. And here you can see that this is your anterior vagal trunk, this is your posterior vagal trunk. And here anteriorly it is related with this left lobe of the liver, clear? So you will find that the diaphragmatic opening of esophagus is a muscular opening. It is present in the muscular part of the diaphragm and it is actually behind the left lobe of the liver. But it, when you will have the esophagus, the esophagus lies anterior to the left crust of the diaphragm. It is lies anterior to the left crust of the diaphragm. So you have to understand that there is a one term is left. What does it mean? That the esophagus will take a turn towards the left at the level of C7, then it opens into the abdominal cavity 2 cm left to the midline and posteriorly it is related with the left crust of diaphragm, left inferior phrenic artery and anteriorly it is related with the left lobe of the liver. Now here in this diagram you can see the relation in an enlarged view. Now here you can see this is the lumen of the esophagus. And here you can see that this is your left side of phrenic artery and this phrenic artery is going behind the esophagus, clear? Now what is the arterial supply of esophagus? The esophagus is actually supplied by the three sources in three different areas. In the cervical region, the source is different. In the thoracic region, the source is different. In abdominal region, the source is different. But these arteries are longitudinally anastomous with each other. So what is the source? In the neck, it is supplied by the inferior thyroid artery. So here you can appreciate that this is the uppermost part and this is the inferior thyroid artery. Now this inferior thyroid artery is a branch of thyrocervical trunk and they are supplying the uppermost part of the esophagus. So they are approaching the esophagus and they are supplying the cervical region. Then when you will enter into the thorax, you are able to appreciate that here these are the branches which are arising from the thoracic aorta and they are supplying the esophagus. 
So in this portion, you have mainly the branches from the uh, thoracic aorta. Now when you will see the lower end, the lower end is actually supplied by this artery and this is your inferior phrenic artery of the left side and this inferior phrenic artery is supplying blood to this abdominal part of your esophagus. So the cervical part supplied by inferior thyroid artery, the thoracic part is supplied by the descending aorta mainly and it also having the branches from the bronchial arteries and abdominal part is supplied by the branches of left phrenic artery that is uh, inferior phrenic and the left gastric artery. Now the venous drainage. The venous drainage is again divided into the three part cervical, thoracic and abdominal. The cervical part is actually go along with the inferior thyroid artery and the vein is inferior thyroid vein. The thoracic part, the thoracic part drains into the azygous system. What about the abdominal part? The abdominal part is most important part. Why most important part? Because abdominal part is a site of portocaval anastomosis. That means the lower one third of the esophagus is having the venous drainage in two area. One is into the inferior vena cava and one is into the superior vena cava. Now why, how into the inferior vena cava? For the inferior vena cava, the veins will go into the portal system and from the portal system, the blood will enter into the inferior vena cava. While the upper part of the lower area, lower esophagus will enter into the azygous system of the vein that will ultimately enters into the superior vena cava. So you will find that the abdominal part partly empty into the left gastric vein and the left gastric veins are actually the part of your portal system while the part will enter into the azygous and hemiazygous system and that is going to open into the superior vena cava so this is a part of cable system clear thus in the lower one third part of the esophagus there is an anastomosis between the portal and venous system of the uh, your venous system and in case in case the portal obstruction occurs, this site is become the site of esophageal varices. Esophageal varices. That means there is a abnormal dilatation of the veins occurs and this is actually site of the hemorrhage in case of portal hypertension. Now this is the image which is showing this vena cable and portal anastomosis. Now you have to understand this, that this is your inferior vena cava. Now this inferior vena cava is here and this inferior vena cava is receiving the hepatic veins. Now this, these hepatic veins are actually draining the portal vein. So this is the portal vein. Now portal vein is entering inside the liver and then the blood ultimately entering into the inferior vena cava via hepatic veins. Now, this is your lower end of the esophagus. Now here you can see this is the lower end of the esophagus. Now these veins are entering into the gastric, left gastric vein and the blood from the left gastric vein is entering into the portal vein. From portal vein it is entering into the liver and then from the liver it will come out from the hepatic vein to enter into the inferior vena cava. So this blood is not directly entering into the inferior vena cava, it is passing through the liver and that's why this system is actually known as portal system. So this is, these veins become the part of portal system. Now there is a one more system. Now these veins, now these veins are opening directly into the azygous vein and azygous vein then open into the superior vena cava. So this site, this junction or this is the site where you are having the anastomosis of the veins of superior vena cava and veins of this portal vein, portal system, clear? So in case of the obstruction in the liver, the blood will actually try to drain inside the venous system. So there is a backflow of the blood will occur and the dilatation of the veins will seen here and that is known as esophageal varices. 
So this condition is often caused by the portal hypertension and this portal venous blood obstruction through the liver in patients who are having the cirrhosis of the liver. So when the liver cirrhosis will occur, the blood flow through the portal vein and through the liver, through the hepatic vein and into the inferior vena cava obstruction is there. So blood in the portal vein now seek, now this blood seeks the alternate pathway or route to attempt in an attempt to return into the inferior vena cava and ultimately to the right atrium. So the blood actually try to find out some alternate pathway so that ultimately the blood will reach to the right atrium. So what will happen that one of these route involve anastomotic channel with veins in the lower one third of the esophagus. So in the lower one third of esophagus you are having the anastomosis between the veins of azygous system and veins of portal system. So the blood in these veins will start to flow like this because the normal channel is obstructed by the liver problems or cirrhosis. Clear? So what will happen that these veins then become greatly dilated and resulting in the esophageal varices on the internal surface of lower one third of esophagus and it may become subject to the hemorrhage. Clear? So sometimes you have this question in exam that why the venous drainage of lower one third of esophagus is very important. Because this lower one third of the esophagus is a site of portocaval anastomosis where you are having the portal drainage and you have the drainage into the azygous system which further drain into the superior vena cava which we are using the cable system. But when this liver obstruction will occur, the blood which is going through the liver into the inferior vena cava now will take this route and that's why the dilatation of the veins will occur into the lower one third of esophagus which is known as esophageal varices. Now what is about the nerve supply? Now nerve supply of esophagus is again become very important for your exam. So it is supplied by the T5 to T9 spinal segments. It is supplied by T5 to T9 spinal segments which are sympathetic supply and these are vasomotor and sensory. Apart from that, when you are talking about the sympathetic supply, it is very important for your exam. The sympathetic supply comes from the recurrent laryngeal nerves and vagus nerve and recurrent laryngeal nerves supply the upper part that means up in the thoracic region while vagus now supply the abdominal part of your esophagus. The important thing is that the postganglionic neurons of parasympathetic system present inside the wall of esophagus and you know that in the wall of esophagus you are having myentric plexus and some mucosal plexus. So the parasympathetic supply which is approaching the esophagus will relay into these neurons of myantric and submucosal plexus and the postganglionic fibers arises in the wall of esophagus itself and supply the area. So this is actually responsible for the opening of the esophagus. What does it mean? That means that in the routine condition or in the normal condition when you are not swallowing, when you are not eating, the esophagus remain closed. And the dilatation of esophagus occurs because of the parasympathetic stimulation. So these myantric and some mucosal plexes are having the postganglionic neurons of parasympathetic system. These are the motor and secretomotor for the glands of esophagus. Now we are having the clinical anatomy and the clinical anatomy part we will discuss in the second phase of this lecture. So in up to this what we are discussed is what is the important about the length it is 25 centimeter. What are the importance about the course you have seen the course has been divided into the cervical thoracic and abdominal region and the important thing which we have seen is about the blood supply venous system and nerve supply. So this is all for this session. Thank you.